supporter of the uh, Tennessee Board of Regents as vice chair. A uh, few announcements before we start uh, with the actual meeting, uh, committee meetings. Uh, I would like to thank everyone in attendance uh, today uh, and the hospitality of Cleveland State as well as uh, TTC Athens, uh, and you will be thanked uh, numerous times during the, the, uh, uh, our stay here because uh, you've really gone out of your way to make us feel at home already, but I do in fact appreciate that. Uh, would like to make a few official introductions to the, the members uh, here as well as to uh, those of you in the audience uh, and will remind everyone that, <clears throat> excuse me, our meetings or this meeting, a series of meetings is in fact being webcast uh, as well for the, uh, the public to participate to the extent that they would like. Uh, we also have on the line with us uh, today uh, one of our regents, Danny Varlin, uh, who is uh, uh, a member of the first committee. But uh, in terms of introductions here today, since our last uh, meeting, the governor has appointed uh, two uh, new regents to the board, uh, our new faculty, as well as our new student regent. Uh, governor Haslam appointed them for a one-year term, uh, which will run from 2012 through 2013. Our faculty regent is Dr. Bob Raines. Dr. Raines is an associate professor of psychology at Jackson State Community College, where he joined the faculty in 2004 and chaired the faculty council uh, for 2011 uh, through 2012. He received his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Tennessee at Martin and his master's degree and PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Southern Mississippi. He is a licensed psychologist and has worked in a variety of medical health settings. Dr. Raines lives in Malasis, Tennessee, which is a small community uh, near Jackson, Tennessee, uh, with his wife. Our student regent is Ms. Ashley Humphrey. Ashley is a 2009 graduate of Saudi Daisy High School and is currently a senior study in accounting at Tennessee Tech University. She serves as the vice president of the TTU Student Government Association. She's on the, she's captain of the Relay for Life team and was selected as a member of the 2012 TTU Presidential Search Committee. Bob and Ashley, we are excited to have you join us and we look forward to working with you and you have already begun your work by participating in earlier committee chair meetings uh, of the board and welcome to the board. Next, I would like to welcome and introduce our student and faculty committee representatives from Cleveland State Community College as well as Tennessee Technology Center in Athens. When we have our quarterly meetings, we will invite uh, the student and faculty representatives to sit in on our committee meetings and uh, engage in the dialogue uh, of the board. And today, uh, representing Cleveland State Community College, we have Mr. Matthew Tolbert, Mr. Tolbert is, a, is an assistant professor of psychology at Cleveland State Community College. His primary goal is to engage students in innovative and meaningful ways in an effort to create long life, excuse me, lifelong learning. With this in mind, he orchestrated a full curriculum redesign of general psychology courses, course of the general psychology course utilizing online technology in a hybrid format. He has won a number of awards at Cleveland State, including Instructor of the Year and Faculty Star Award for his service to the community. His interest in psychology and community development 
have led to uh, led him to be an invited speak to be invited as a speaker for issues and programs such as community and service programs for local Head Start classrooms, as well as community forums and symposiums. He currently serves as faculty senate president. Next, we have Ms. Alicia Durham. She is currently student senate president at Cleveland State Community College. Her leadership abilities have been strengthened by her involvement in, student, in the Student Senate. She is currently serving as one of the student representatives on Cleveland State's QEP committee, part of Cleveland State's reaffirmation process with SAC's Commission on Colleges. In addition, she is a member of the leadership team for the Baptist Collegiate Ministry which is a joint ministry between Cleveland State and Lee University. As a 19-year-old sophomore, Alicia plans to continue her education towards a bachelor's in psychology with an emphasis in family and marriage counseling. Representing the T Technology Center at Athens are Mr. Lewis Turpin, Mr. Turpin is a senior teacher of automotive technology at Tennessee Technology Center at Athens. He has been at TTC Athens since 1994. He has served on statewide curriculum and equipment committees. He is recognized by the National Institute for Automotive Service Excellence as a professional world-class technician who has tested and obtained ASE certification in 35 specialty areas. He is an evaluation team leader for NATEF in automotive collision repair and diesel engine program certification. He has served as a national judge for Skills USA competition. He is an officer in the Kingston Century Club Sports Booster Program and teacher and teaches hunters safety programs for the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency. He is married to Denise uh, Turpin, who is the uh, director at TTC Harriman. We also have from TTC uh, Athens, Mr. Dusty Sadler. Mr. Sadler graduated from Alcoa High School in 2007 where he served in the Technology Student Association. He is currently a student in the computer electronic program at TTC at Athens and is scheduled to graduate this December. He is employed at Staples as an Easy Tech Associate and plans to continue his education in computer engineering when he graduates. I want to thank all of you for being with us today, and we trust that you will benefit from your time with us and engage in some of the discussions today by asking questions as we move through our committee agendas. Thanks for being with us today. Our official order of business for today will be the, we will be hearing from four committees, those committees being the Committee on the Tennessee Technology Centers, the Committee on Academic Policies and Programs, Committee on Personnel and Compensation, and the Committee on Finance and Business Operations. At this time, I would turn the chair over to the acting chair for the Committee on Tennessee Technology Centers, Regent Fran Markham. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> I call the Committee on the Tennessee Technology Centers to order uh, as acting chair for Danny Varlin, new chair. Good afternoon and welcome. We have four items on the agenda today. They include the proposed program terminations, modifications, and new technical programs implementations. Two, employer and alumni survey report, which is informational reporting. Three, approval of Rec a recommendation for the director at TTC Crump, and four, 
highlighting the Skills USA National Awards. The first item on our agenda is the proposed program terminations, modifications, and new technical programs implementations. This is information was included in the materials previously sent to you. You've had the opportunity to review this item and background materials. Does anyone have any questions for Vice Chancellor King? Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The second item is informational reporting, which includes the employer and alumni survey report. This information was also um, part of the packet that was sent to you. Does anyone have any questions for the Vice Chancellor regarding this report? Vice Chancellor, do you have any comments about this report? Madam Chair, yes, I do. Um, I want a couple of things I want to point out. Because, you know, we truly think it's important to get input from alumni and employers because that keeps us current, keeps us abreast. If we're doing some things we need to improve, we want to hear that. I was pleased to hear that 96% of the alumni and student uh, responses were satisfactory above. And it was exciting this year. And out of the 14 different areas that were asked questions on, in the excellent category, there was improvement in all but two. And we need to look at those other two and see what those are. And so it's nice to hear that, that we're doing things right with our alumni and our students this, uh, and our employers. The second thing that I really wanted to point out that, you know, we're still running completion rates at over 75%, and it's still getting a lot of attention nationwide. And that's an exciting time. We've got states from Texas, Ohio, Indiana, all coming in wanting to find out what we're doing right. They want to take back to their home and do it. The other thing, we've got placement rates in all of our programs in the related fields of, of 82%. That is up from last year. I think the economy is proving by a couple of percentage points. But the main thing I'd like to point out this morning that somewhat gets overlooked in all this discussion about completion rates and placement rates is that every student graduating and getting these jobs from a technology center are graduating debt free. There's not a student loan program at the Technology Center. So we're not only taking students graduating at a rate that three or four times the national average in some cases, but these students are walking out the door getting good jobs without a debt. So it's something we want to need to uh, pay attention and And we're going to start publicizing that a lot more nationwide. I think it's getting a lot of attention because that is an exciting thing that these students are going to work. And they can live their life without paying back student loans. So, all right, Madam Chair, that can... And I do want to take this time to welcome Regent Varlin on the line and as our new chair. It's a shame that she's not here today. We we'll look forward to seeing her tomorrow. Thank you so much, James. And I'm very much looking forward to chairing this committee and continuing the great work that um, Regent Markham started as, as the chair of this committee and uh, seeing all of you soon, actually tomorrow. <clears throat> Thank you, Regent Varlin. Any other comments from Regents? The next item on our agenda is the approval of recommendation for the director at the Tennessee Technology Center at Crump. Thank you, Regent Markham. This, uh, this search appears like it's been going on a few years, and it seems like it has. Uh, the search was opened on March 2012 uh, after the retirement of Dan Spears. Uh, Jeff Sisk was appointed as interim director and has served that job admirably. We put together a 12-member search committee, which included Regent Markham, we thank you, and it's become your nearly full-time job. So, but we thank you for hanging in there. It also included uh, uh, Jackson State President uh, Bruce Blanding, and we had representatives from the faculty, staff, students, the General Advisory Committee, and community leaders. After a careful review of applicants and interviews and input from the search committee, Ms. Mrs. Rita Summers is being recommended for appointment as the TTC director. Ms. Summers has an Associate Degree of Applied Science in General Technology from Volunteer State, a Bachelor of Science in Management and Organizational Development from Bethel College, and a Master's in Education Administration and Supervision from Tennessee State University. She has over 18 years of service with the TTC system, starting out as a cosmetology instructor at the TTC Dixon, and she held that position for 12 years. 
She also served as recruiting coordinator from 2006 to 7 at the Extension Campus in Clarksville. Ms. Summers started as assistant director at the TTC Nashville in January 2010. And at one point, she sat with you. She was a faculty regent uh, in 2000, 2001. So, uh, and did a great job as faculty regent. And she's also a graduate of the 2007-8 TTC Leadership Program. And Madam Chair, I truly believe uh, Ms. Summers comes to us as one of the most qualified candidates from our system. Uh, Ms. Ms. Summers has also completed her coursework on her doctorate and is now going to go through the dissertation gauntlet. So, but uh, I truly believe she is superbly qualified and I recommend without hesitation or, res or a reservation, Mr. Rita Summers as the next director at the TTC at Crump. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I would like to make a few comments on the, on the search. We ha had a, a wonderful search committee a uh, very dedicated group to dedicated to finding the very best for Crump leadership. And um, it was a pleasure to work with them. We had outstanding applicants in, the, in that field. And um, I too believe that we narrowed the field and selected the very best one uh, for Crump. And we're delighted to, uh, to make this recommendation to you today. You've heard the recommendations to appoint Ms. Summers as the next director of the Tennessee Technology Center at Crump. Do I hear a motion to approve the appointment of Ms. Summers? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Regent Montgomery and seconded by Kisper. Regent Kisper. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, I believe Ms. Summers is in our audience. Can I, may I ask you to stand, please? Yeah. And let's welcome her to the Board of Regents. <laughs> We're very pleased to have you on our team. Thank you. And the last item on our agenda is a Skills USA presentation on the national awards and recognitions received by the Tennessee Technology Centers. This is always a highlight of this September program. Vice Chancellor. Regent Markham, I pretty much look forward to this September, more meeting from September to September, because this is one of the more exciting things that, that we do. Um, you know, Skills USA is ex extremely important to the TTC organization. You know, I look at, um, as 13 years as Vice Chancellor, I look at one of the most important decisions we made was get involved in this organization at the level that we did. You know, we had a history of providing skilled technicians, but there were some components I thought we were, we were missing out on, and which one was leadership. And I don't think this, I think this organization, uh, no other organization does any better in providing leadership skills for, for career and technical students than Skills USA. You know, it's a 300,000, 320,000 member organization. So it's a huge organization. The competition is all business and industry related, but the leadership component of it is what's important, I think, to us. I think you'll see all these great red jackets here today. And let's, let's make note, as I told Regent Duckett, these are all national champions. These are not just, these, these students have excelled. Um, I would, I've got about a two minute video that I'd like you to see, and I think you, once you see this, I hope all of you at some point get the opportunity to attend the national convention because you're going to see the enthusiasm and excitement when you've got 15,000 of these red jackets running around and just enthusiastic and the business and industry support. And then I'd like to int introduce you to a very special guest we have with us to make a few remarks. So, Carol, would you please cue up the video? SkillsUSA is a partnership of students, teachers, and industry working together to ensure America has a skilled workforce. Each year, some 15,000 of these individuals gather in Kansas City, Missouri for SkillsUSA's National Leadership and Skills Conference. The conference is a showcase for the top career and technical education students in the nation from high school and college. All 50 states, three U.S. territories, and Washington, D.C. are represented. And events include exciting opening and closing ceremonies with nationally renowned speakers, the largest technical education trade show in the nation, 
educational seminars, a career fair, and a host of other attractions. The conference's main event is the SkillsUSA Championships, where nearly 6,000 state champions compete for national bronze, silver, and gold medals in nearly 100 skilled and leadership contests. These students are America's best and brightest. The competition covers 16 football fields of floor space and a huge variety of skills, culinary arts, firefighting, computer maintenance, broadcast news production, carpentry, robotics, crime scene investigation, advertising design, practical nursing, and many more. Made possible by financial and in-kind donations exceeding $30 million, the SkillsUSA Championships is the greatest day of industry volunteerism in America. The day after the championships, students and advisors head into the community for a day of service, reflecting SkillsUSA's mission to develop technical and leadership skills in its members. These kids could be some quabbers, or swimming, or having fun, but they work in At week's end, contest winners are presented their medals in an Olympic-style award ceremony. For many of these young people, it's the best moment of their lives and the start of a future filled with promise. Too often, we hear what's wrong with America's youth. SkillsUSA's inspiring National Leadership and Skills Conference offers the chance to see what's right. Find out more at SkillsUSA.org. Regent Griscom, you may be interested to know in Regent Roddy that, you know, we host the state, our state competition in Ch Chattanooga each year. And notice that at the end of that video, you talk in Kansas City at the National, we do, the students do a day of volunteerism. They give something back to the city. So this upcoming year, we're going to do that in Chattanooga. We're going to have our skilled students. We're going to gather a team. We met in Chattanooga last week, matter of fact, and we're going to start pulling industry, business, and community leaders together and look at a day of, of volunteerism for our students to go. When we leave Chattanooga, we leave it a better place as well. So it's going to be an exciting opportunity. We're going to be one of the first states, I think, in the nation to do that at a state competition. I mean, so we're going to look forward to doing that. Um, you know, the next person I want to introduce is um, the executive director of Skills USA, is Mr. Tim Lawrence. Is once I said, you know, this organization is a 320,000 member organization. This is a very busy man. There's not a more dynamic executive director of an organization in the country. You know, uh, Tim was a former state administrator. He's a former teacher, and he was a former student. And Tim, in his day, wore one of these red jackets as well, and is and probably. Uh, one of the most respected executive directors from as far as business and industry in the nation. So I welcome Mr. Tim Lawrence. Thank you, James, and thank you, Regents, for having me here today. It's an honor and a pleasure. And at the National Organization of Skills USA, I want you to know that we stand in awe of what you're doing here in Tennessee, particularly with the Tennessee Technology Centers nationally recognized, but also what we believe is the most dynamic uh, career and technical education training center anywhere in the country. As we look at the participation in SkillsUSA, Tennessee is the largest state association at the post-secondary level, having over 11,000 students involved each and every year. And we're so proud that every campus of the Tennessee Technology Center has 100% involvement of their students. But SkillsUSA is defined as a partnership of students, teachers, and industry working together to ensure this country has a skilled workforce. And in that process, we help every student to excel. Our mission is to empower our members to become world-class workers and responsible American citizens. Above all else, as Mr. King said, there's a, huge, there's a huge technical component, but above all else, SkillsUSA really is defined at its core as a leadership and character development organization. So as students are learning their technical skills, we're working with them in professional development. Everything from time management, resume building, uh, communication, teamwork, problem solving, critical thinking, building their employment portfolio so when they do in go into the world of work, they're ready to show off their best work to potential employers. I can tell you this morning, uh, 
with Jim from Chattanooga State, I toured the, the Volkswagen Training Academy. And um, the, the, the work that's going on there with Chattanooga State and the Tennessee Technology Centers is outstanding. In fact, one of the medal winners, uh, one team of medal winners that you won't see here today was the team of mechatronic students from the Volkswagen Training Center and Chattanooga State TTC. They won the bronze medal at the national level, their first year competing. So what's happening there with the technology of mechatronics is a combination of mechanics, pneumatics, hydraulics, and computer uh, programmer logical contro controllers. It's an amazing thing that's happening. But when students get involved in this organization, they do come together as a family, and they do truly excel, not only in their, their technical areas, but in their leadership area as well. We're so proud that, that the Tennessee Technology Centers are being recognized nationwide as a model for career and technical education and training at the post-secondary level. In fact, just two nights ago in Washington, D.C. at the Ritz-Carlton, we honored Nick Pinchuk, the CEO and chairman of Snap-on Tools Incorporated. Nick is one of those people that stands behind these students at the national level. And SkillsUSA enjoys the partnership of over 1,100 businesses, industry, and labor organizations that really work together in partnership with our teachers and students to develop the standards that industry needs for successful employment. Nick mentioned something that I believe is so true of your system here. He said that Snap-on is so proud to be involved, just like the other uh, nearly 1,100 companies, because as this country's culture seems to offer career and technical education sometimes as a consolation prize to students, we celebrate the fact that these students are enrolled in a technical pathway, because that technical pathway it's what's kept this country strong for so many years, and it's what's going to bring this economy back and make us stronger in the future. The uh, Tennessee Technology Centers also this year, as they came to the National Conference, and again, this year it was a $36 million event. It occupied 16 football fields of floor space. From robotics and engineering to culinary arts to carpentry, you saw the video, there are 94 competitions that happened this year, 6,000 competitors. It took 60,000 volunteer hours from business and industry to make that possible and students that were there being tested against national standards. And the Tennessee students excelled. There were 16 gold medals, eight silver, and six bronze. Very few states, the larger states like Texas, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, they do not bring home that many medals back to their home state. These young people you see setting before you today are exceptional. And they've proven that against national standards developed by the finest technical training managers in the country from some of the finest corporations. And we're so, so proud of them. At that same event that I mentioned a couple nights ago, uh, Bill Simons from the Harvard School of Graduate Education was there. Our two students from Tennessee had a chance to meet Bill and talk with him. And there were so many other industry leaders there. But not only has Bill and the Harvard uh, School of Graduate Education's Pathways to Prosperity Project recognized TTC as a model in this country, so has the Gates Foundation and so many others. And I can tell you, being uh, based in the Washington, D.C. area, Washington, D.C., the federal system, everyone that, that comes together in D.C. to take a look at education reform is looking at your model as a key component of that. But as we looked at these, uh, these medal winners, uh, not only did Tennessee bring back uh, those, those medals that I talk about, they also brought back two national leaders, and they're going to be introduced now. One of those young, uh, young leaders, uh, Mary Cameroon uh, from Chattanooga State, had the opportunity to present the Champion of the Year Award at the Ritz in front of 400 people Tuesday evening to Mr. Nick Ch Pinchuk, the, the Chairman of, and CEO of Snap-on. But Mary's an outstanding leader, uh, and I want to tell you that we elect from within as, as James talked about, 320,000 students being involved this year, there have been 10.9 million students come through this program in the, in the past 47 years. And every year, from our beginning, we've elected 15 students, elected by their peers at the national level to serve this organization. 15. 10 high school, 5 college and post-secondary. Two of those this year from Tennessee. Out of 320,000 people, and only 15 national leaders, two are from this system in Tennessee. So it's my pleasure to introduce Mary to come up and talk about her experience. And I thank you so much for the honor and the pleasure of being here to speak with you and congratulate you again as we stand in awe of the system that you have here in Tennessee and the great things that you're doing for students in career and technical education. Thank you.
good afternoon. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude to Tennessee Board of Regents, the Tennessee Technology Center at Chattanooga State, and the Skills USA organization. Because of the dedicated leaders, administrators, uh, teachers, uh, volunteers, staff members, industry and business partners, I have the confidence to follow my passion. I am here today to talk to you about what impact Skills USA has had on me. I got involved with Skills USA in the fall of last year. I did not realize that this joining of this organization was going to be an avenue to change the direction of my life and an opportunity to rediscovering myself. At TTC Chattanooga, my instructor um, advised me that I, or encouraged me to run for local office, and I did so. And during the election process, I told them, please, whatever you do, make sure you don't elect me president. I don't know much about Skills USA, nor do I know really how to be any chapter organization's president. The day came, and on the top part of the piece of paper that I got assigned, I look and see, uh, definition for or the uh, role duties for the president. I thought I don't have the right piece of paper and at that moment something happened. I realized they believe in me. They believe that I have the qualities and the ability to be a leader. Surely enough I went on and became a state officer. Then in April we had our uh, state conference and as I participated in my role as an officer and then had the opportunity to compete and um, because now I have people backing me who have faith in me I went on and became a state gold medalist and now I decided hey I can do this I'm gonna run for national office so I went down at the time to Mr. Carl Chrisman who was the Tennessee State Director and said, Mr. Chrisman, I would like to be a national uh, candidate to be elected for Skills USA uh, National Officer Team. Okay, Mary, we can do this. Now, because I'm the gold medalist for Tennessee in my interviewing process, and I'm the state uh, officer now national candidate, that meant that I had to represent Tennessee at national level, and then run a campaign, and really, as an aesthetic student, I don't know a whole lot about politics nor campaigning. And here, I have Mr. Vice Chancellor James King, who said, I'll be your campaign manager. <laughs> so now, <laughs> so now I'm at the point where I'm saying, okay, I've got to compete and uh, run for campaign for, uh, uh, for national office. And I thought, well, how is this going to happen? Because at such a huge event, this will be very time con consuming. I do not want my stress level to be through the roof. And that decision that was challenging at the beginning was made easy within 30 seconds, once again, of talking to Vice Chancellor James King, who said, Mary, you're going to compete and you're going to run. OK? Yes, sir. End of story. <laughs> Fast forward to the national conference. I do meet the delegates, uh, the speeches, as well as the question and answer sessions. I look at the back of the room and I see my advisor. I see Dr. Jim Barrett. I see Dr. Lynn Goodman, Dr. Kara Purier, my other Tennessee delegates, Mr. Boyd Heston, Mr. John Lee, Ms. Dottie Webb, and some of them are there with their families. This kind of support was amazing. And then to walk out the door and run into Mr. James King, who said, I knew you could do it, was very rewarding. So to make a long story short, I was elected to be a national officer. And um, I got the opportunity to learn more, and, or now I continue to learn more about Skills USA. Now, last year, I had browsed through the Skills USA website and saw Tim Lawrence, Mr. Tim Lawrence, and to me at the time, he was just afar the big honcho of Skills USA. And um, today, 
I know better. I know him much better. And he, it's the, what I know, it's not from the website. It's from sitting at breakfast with Mr. Lawrence and seeing him listen with genuine care and concern about the students that are 18 years old, the students that are 40 years old, and are concerned about the economy, getting skills, marketable skills that are going to help in their future, in their careers, help support families. I know Mr. Lawrence because in, during national officer training, um, he is there at the ropes course as we develop leadership and teamwork skills. It's from interacting with him at the champion's dinner and a, a lady coming to meet me. She's the medical director of Air Products and says, are you Mary? Mr. Lawrence wanted to make sure that I talk to you. Opportunity, opportunities as those would not be possible without the support that we get from you, without the support of Skills USA, the advisors, the instructors. And um, so every time I get the question, what has Skills USA uh, done for you? Or how has Skills USA, USA impacted your life? I believe the same answer that I have today, I will have it tomorrow. Skills USA has prepared me with leadership abilities, marketable skills, and it has motivated me to be a leader and not only in my everyday life, but also in the workforce. And all that is possible because of all of you. At this time, I would like to recognize my wonderful instructor, Mrs. Rhonda Castleberry. So it only takes one person, and that was the person for me that started this amazing journey. Thank you. And I would like to call to the stage my fellow Tennessee national officer from one of the TTCs, Mark Rourke, and he will talk to you all. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chancellor Morgan. Vice Chair Duckett, Regent Markham, and members of the Tennessee Technology Center community. It is a pleasure for me to bring you the Tennessee Technology Center report of the 2012 National Leadership Skills Conference. My name is Mark Rourke. I am a student at the Tennessee Technology Center at Elizabethan, a 2012 Skills USA National Gold Medalist, and I uh, currently serve as the Skills USA National Parliamentarian. This year has been a, an exciting year for the Tennessee Technology Centers and Tennessee Post-Secondary Skills USA. The Tennessee Technology Centers were represented well at the Skills USA National Conference in Kansas City this summer with over 180 attendees, including competitors, state and national officers, delegates and advisors. During the national conference, 71 Tennessee Technology Center students from across the state entered 49 contests. The Tennessee post-secondary representation shined on awards night, receiving a total of 29 medals, 15 gold, eight silver, and six bronze. A total of 54 students from the Tennessee Technology Centers placed in the top 10, and 36 received skilled Connect certificates for their performance on skills assessments. In addition, Tennessee's fourth and fifth consecutive national officer were elected. Another highlight of this conference was Vice Chancellor King's election as the Skills USA National Board President. Beyond the election of officers and competitions, the Tennessee Technology Center's committee to com uh, commitment to community service was also recognized with 12 students re receiving Presidential Volunteer Service Awards, seven gold, three silver, and two bronze. In addition, four Tennessee Technology Centers received low Skills USA grants to continue to serve the needs of our communities. As demonstrated in our performance at Nationals this year, our Skills USA participants are truly champions at work in their technical fields, leadership, 
and community service. At this time, I would like to recognize all of the Skills USA gold medalists and their advisors. As I call your name, names, please stand. Gold medalist in diesel equipment technology from Tennessee Technology Center, Center Harriman, Coy Kidd. Coy's, inst sorry. Coy's instructor is Kevin Human. <clears throat> Gold medalist in medical assisting from Tennessee Technology Center, Knoxville, Christopher Pollock. Christopher's instructor is Christina Nagy, and his Skills USA advisor is Boyd Heston. <laughs> Gold medalists in sustainability solutions from TTC McKenzie, Jimmy Tosh and Mark Balkum. Jimmy and Mark's instructor is Bruce Moore. Gold medalists in opening and closing ceremonies from TTC Elizabethan, Brandon Dickens, Ashley English, Tracy Gilmer, Chris O'Neill, Eric Smith, Olivia, Olivia Kennedy, and Mark Rourke. Our instructors, our advisors, and are Sandy Barker, <laughs> Emma Hobson, Nate Hall, and John Lee. Gold medalists in Quiz Bowl from TTC Newburn, Chris Cox, Jessica Glisson, Jerry Mann, and Stephen Pawn. Their advisor is Dottie Webb. <laughs> On behalf of all of the Skills USA participants, I would like to say thank you to all our, of our advisors and instructors. Without your hard work, assistance, and dedication, we would not be in front of the board today. I would especially like to thank my instructor and Skills USA advisor, Mr. John Lee, for the support and ensuring that I was prepared for the national election and competition. In addition, I would like to thank all of the Tennessee Technology Center's directors and the central office, especially Vice Chancellor James King. Without their support, the success of the statewide Skills USA program would not be possible. Finally, along with the other gold medalists, I would like to thank the Chancellor, Vice Chair, and the members of the TTC committee for their continual support of the Tennessee Technology Center's and Skills USA. You are champions for the Tennessee Technology Center system, and as a token of our appreciation, we would like to make a special presentation to you. Chancellor, Vice Chair, and members of the TTC committee, please join me at the front of the stage. Please take a step forward to receive your plaque or medal when I state your name. After receiving the gold medal, please remain on the stage with the students and advisor for a brief photo opportunity. <laughs> Chancellor John Morgan. Vice Chair Regent Gregory Duckett. Tennessee Technology Center Past Committee Chair, Regent Fran Markle. <laughs> Ch 
Chancellor John Morgan. <laughs> Vice Chair Regent Gregory Duckett. <laughs> Regent Steve Copeland. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Regent Tom Grissel. <laughs> Regent Jonas Kisper. Regent Fran Markham. Regent Paul Montgomery. Regent Bob Rains. Student reps, Dusty Sadler, TTC Athens. And Alyssa Durha. Cleveland State. She'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Faculty reps, Lewis Turpin, TTC Athens. And Matthew W. Tolbert, Cleveland State. I would like to personally thank all of you for the wonderful job you guys do. Uh, Tennessee Technology Center has done a lot for me, really turned my life around. And I know anywhere I go, I will succeed in my career field. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate every, everything you want to do. Madam Chair, that concludes the report for the Tennessee Technology Center. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. How very exciting. Congratulations to each and every one of you on your gold achievements, your golden achievements. Mark and Mary, I know that we'll be hearing much more from each one of you, and we'll look forward to it. And I think that we're all in agreement that we are all going to want to participate and follow, follow Skills USA. Thank you so much for a wonderful program. Let's give them a round of applause. And if there is no further business to come before this committee, I move we adjourn. Okay. Thank you, Regent Markham. Appreciate the participation in the committee. Uh, excellent job uh, by the members of Skills USA and the Tennessee Technology Centers. Uh, at this time, I would like to call the members of the Committee on Academic Policies and Programs to come to the podium. Uh, that would be Regent Paul uh, Montgomery. Uh, excuse me. That would be uh, the Committee Chair, Regent Bob Thomas, uh, Regent John Farris, Regent Ashley Humphreys, Regent Kevin Huffman, who is not with us today, Regent Emily Reynolds, Regent Rich Rhoda, uh, Regent Danny Varlin, 
and Regent Bob Rains. I'd like to uh, call the Committee on Academic Policies and Programs to order. Uh, I note that we have a quorum. I also will note that I'm afraid our committee meeting is going to be a little mundane compared to the one that preceded. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation that was made uh, by Skills USA, and we certainly appreciate all the participation. There are three items on our agenda today. Uh, the first item is a proposed revision to TBR policy 2.01.00, general education requirements and degree requirements. I'm gonna call on interim Vice Chancellor Kay Clark to present this item, Kay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Um, the proposed revision before you today is an, another element in our overall effort to establish commonality among transfer processes in our institutions. This re, uh, revision concerns the method of calculating grade point averages for transfer students. Currently, uh, our institutions vary in the manner in which they calculate GPAs. And so, in keeping with the seamless transfer that we have established through Gen Ed and, and through the Tennessee Transfer Pathways, our uh, academic officers put forth the, uh, an idea that had actually been presented earlier in the decade but did not, uh, did not come to fruition because we were involved with banner implementation and so forth. But it was felt at this time, since we had done all of this work on transfer, that we should try to, to uh, establish commonality. Basically, this policy indicates that a student who transfers will begin anew with a grade point average upon transfer. Some of our institutions do that way, others don't. And, uh, but the prevailing national practice has it that it is done the way that we're describing it, where the GPA would be uh, excluded. Now credit, of course, would be given for all courses, um, but the GPA would be started over. Importantly, 
one of the uh, elements in this is that we would um, recognize the grade of D in transfer. Some institutions do not give credit for Ds, but in this revised policy, the D would be honored. Now, institutions will have the prerogative, though, where there are areas that require specific admission criteria that include higher grades or certain GPAs or certain grades, the institutions may impose that by having looked at the student's entire record. And there are certain cases where outside entities require that full uh, consideration of the record. But in this case, in mo oh, most cases, the student, this would not apply, but uh, importantly, the grade of D will be accepted. Now, that has some reflection from the uh, enactment of the Tennessee Transfer Pathways, which involves not only TBR, but UT. TBR and UT agreed that if a student transfers with, in those uh, TTP pathways, that the grade of D would be accepted and no repetition would be enacted upon the student unless, again, there was some reason for a certain admission into certain programs, but students nursing, education, other areas that would require higher GPA. But in all cases, the D would be honored as credit. Um, I think that's an important consideration because UT, of course, has been, it's been hard, you know, in, in transferring Ds, and, and they said that if a student receives it, then we're going to take it. And this is important in perhaps in general education. As an example, if a student is uh, majoring in uh, English, perhaps receives a D in college algebra, in some cases an institution would require retaking that not in this new transfer policy. They would not be required to take it over. Again, unless it was some specific programmatic element that required it. Now, the lottery scholarship will not be affected by this because uh, by state practice, that all has to be followed and the entire record has to be kept. Institutions do that right now, regardless of what they do on calculating transfer GPAs, the whole record has to be kept. Uh, institutions would also have the prerogative to uh, impose their own uh, criteria for honors, and so that would not be affected. Also, repeat policies would be preserved as well. Now, this is a large change and will require a magnitude of work on the part of our campuses, so it's envisioned that we would begin this in the summer of 2014, if you approve it. Uh, so that, in essence, is what we are proposing, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Do any members of the committee have a question? Yes, Regent Ferris. Yeah, I was going to ask, is this for transferring from the community colleges to the universities, or would it include? It's all institutions. From, from yeah. university to university? Right, exactly. And at, at what stage, I mean, if I were a senior uh, and I wanted to transfer from University of Memphis to MTSU, would I just have a start from scratch by senior year? Well, uh, in, in, in the cases, in, in most cases, that student would have to have a creditable transfer record to get in there, and if they're just lacking one year, it probably would have little effect on that student. Now, truly, some student, students will be impacted by this in, in, in the following ways. If a student, uh, let's take the community college student as an example. For instance, they may have had some difficulty in the first year, but then caught fire in the sophomore year and, and, and improved their grades, but still their GPA would have been maybe 2.25. Upon transfer to the university, they have an opportunity to start anew and achieve a better grade point average in that regard. Of course, the student who transfers over with 3.5 will begin anew as well. However, in most cases, if a student has that GPA, they're going to achieve it wherever they go. So th there is that element. We won't know, of course, until we enact it as to exact uh, elements of that. So, so I guess, just, sure. so if, I, if I do poorly, I guess, for, for you know, my entire career at, at school and then I transfer to a new school, 
I could, I could, all that would just be water under the bridge, I guess. Is, is that well, uh, right? Well, not exactly. Uh, you know, the entire record is still preserved, but you just start over with a new GPA at the new school. Yeah. It, it, the, the, the grades are still noted on the transcript. If you'll notice there, the entire record is preserved. Okay. Yeah. Further questions? Mr. Chairman? Yes. My question Regent is Reynolds. that the, um, the, the lead-in period that you're giving us of almost two years, will our, will our schools need additional resources to implement this? Uh, there will be an adjustment uh, in software, and, 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 um, and it will require some of that. We don't know the uh, exact magnitude of that, but we will have an advisory group that will be established soon to enact that. And that's why we're having such a long lead time here in order to enact this. And uh, so hopefully we can get those all settled. But we're gonna have experts from the campuses that deal with this, not only academic officers and so forth, but a lot of admissions officers and registrars, and of course the information technology people on each campus. Further questions? Now, and I want to say all three of the sub-councils approve this, not only academic, but faculty and student affairs. Vice Chancellor Duckett. I, I understand. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I understand the process that we are going right. through. I guess since the entire transcript is being preserved, yes. I'm failing to understand the philosophy or the practical basis for making this change. Well, in, in that we have... So we have varying practices. Some institutions do it pretty much as we're stating here, and the community colleges particularly do a lot of that. But then there are variances among our institutions. So the, the desire, uh, a part of our academic officers, was to establish a common method of doing this. And as we did the research earlier in the decade on this, it was clear that over 70% of the institutions in the United States do it in the manner in which we're prescribing. And I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Duckett, the grade of D is uh, always a problem. And that has been an element that uh, has created a lot of, of consternation as to the varying practices of how Ds are uh, awarded or not awarded. And, uh, you know, I guess it'd be better if we didn't have a grade of D, but we have one. and so. This uh, honors the grade of D, uh, except in those cases I said where you had to have specific admission requirements. And, and a follow-up, and I guess my technical concern is not with dealing with the grade of D, because I understand right. that dilemma, but let's explore Regent Ferris's example, but make it applicable uh, where if you have an student who tr has made C's right. at a TBR institution and then got things together and then chose to transfer to another TBR institution that last year and yeah. they're in a position to say, well, I graduated with a three well, point whatever as opposed to what it, the C. Yeah, I understand you. It, it, it could be overstated in that regard. But uh, the instances of that are will probably be pretty rare, in my view. Okay. You know, as you as you transfer uh, that late in your career. Uh, however, if an employer, for instance, um, reviews transcripts, then they will see the whole record. It's just that the, the GPA that was achieved at the receiving institution in that last year will be higher than possibly it would have been in the whole record. But the whole record is preserved. Vice, Vice uh, Chairman Duckett, it might help you a little bit. It's not how you start, but it's how you finish. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, there, there is a great incentive here for that, students who, uh, <laughs> for students who have not done too well in the first two years, but as I said, they have caught fire a bit. This is an excellent chance for them to start anew. And I think the students who have done well wherever they started are going to continue to do well as they go on, usually. Are there further questions? This is a fairly significant change in, in our policy, and uh, certainly I think these questions have been very helpful. Uh, are there any other questions? 
Mr. Chairman, may I ask? Yes, certainly, may I, Mr. Talbert. Uh, in regards to the uh, universities accepting these degrees from a community college, right? Uh, is there a minimum GPA required for universities to accept those degrees, or if it's awarded, do they just accept it outright? Well, in, in, uh, to transfer, you would have to have a 2.0. Okay. Yeah. It's just that when you get there, you start over. If that D drops me below a 2.0, then obviously I'm going to have to go back and retake. You're going to have to do something before you get over there or whatever. The right. Exactly. Thank you. Further questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve this change in our policy. Motion by uh, Regent Raines. Is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Humphrey. Uh, is there any further discussion? This requires a voice vote. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, I like sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. We'll now move to the uh, second item on our agenda, uh, which is the approval of a uh, new degree program at Volunteer State Community College, Vice uh, uh, right. Chancellor uh, Clark. The, the proposal from Volunteer State is to establish a new Associate of Applied Science in Entertainment Media Production with four concentrations, video production, music production, multimedia and web design, and music business. This is a 60-hour degree program, and we think it responds well to the directives of the Complete College Act, which ask our institutions to look at relevant programs that could be developed that would support the workforce. And as you know, Volunteer State is very close by Nashville and, and all the uh, entertainment industry that is associated there. They've done their research and found that there are opportunities in these technical aspects that would provide opportunities for graduates. Also, this particular program lends itself well to another area that uh, has been emphasized lately, in, in, especially in the community, uh, Complete College Act and otherwise, that is cohort and block scheduling of courses. This is, lends itself to that quite well, where a, a, a cadre of students begins together and they carry through to the end. The, um, this proposal would be offered at, or this degree, if you prove it, will be offered at the main campus and also at the Livingston Center. Now, also, courses that are in, you know, individual courses may be offered at off-campus sites, such as Springfield and other places that Volunteer State has offerings. The institution, this is very important too, it allows the institution to really build upon existing facilities that it has. They have excellent uh, professional grade television studios, film editing rooms and equipment, and this just fits in quite well in that regard. It has that capacity. The cost of this would be minimal to the institution is less than $10,000, but that would probably be covered by uh, uh, fees and tuition easily. So in, this is not an expensive program to enact at Volunteer State. And um, the projection is that when up and running, there would be 20 graduates per year in this regard. And uh, they have an advisory board at Volunteer State in uh, entertainment media production advisory. Uh, that's the board that, uh, the external board, and they have recommended this. And it's an excellent opportunity for students to take advantage of opportunities in that business. And uh, we'll be anxious to see how this goes if you approve it. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions of uh, Vice Chancellor Clark on this item? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Motion by Re Regent Reynolds. Is there a second? second? Second by Regent Ferris. Any further discussion? This also requires a voice vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. The third and last item on our agenda is an informational report from uh, Chancellor Morgan on the 2012 fall enrollment. Chancellor Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and I'll be brief uh, with this, but uh, 
this is information that we had developed over the last few days that I felt like would be of interest uh, to you as we uh, think about kind of where we are in terms of enrollment uh, at our institutions. I think each of you have been given to, just at the beginning of this committee meeting a, a handout that uh, is the preliminary enrollment report, and I say preliminary because it is. Uh, it, it, there will still be some adjustments to numbers as we go forward over the next few weeks. Um, I'm not sure that THEC yet has finalized uh, uh, from their perspective the enrollment uh, numbers for, for the state as a whole. Uh, but this is basically it. It won't change uh, much uh, between now and, and the time that it's final. Um, what you see is, is that on a head count basis, that's just the number of students uh, registering at our institutions, um, head count has decreased 3.6% uh, across the entire system. Um, that was a, a decrease of about 3.3% at our universities. Uh, and 4% at our community colleges. Um, on a full-time equivalent basis, it's basically enrollment, to, uh, number of credit hours divided by 12, I guess, K is the way we, we compute that. Um, you can see that the change uh, is a little bit higher, 3.6 in our universities and 5.4 uh, at our community colleges. Uh, the report includes within it uh, information about uh, gender uh, and uh, the uh, percent of underrepresented minorities or African Americans in particular uh, at our institutions. Uh, just a word about the enrollments. I mean, it's, it, it, it is never uh, a particularly happy event when enrollment uh, declines, but when you look at enrollments historically, and, and we did some analysis on this, and we'll continue to do some, and, and perhaps uh, by the December meeting have a little more information for you about this. Um, but. Enrollment in higher education institutions, particularly in community colleges, is really counter-cyclical. Uh, as the economy uh, runs into difficulties, if you look historically at past recessions, uh, it's not uncommon for enrollment at all our institutions, but particularly community colleges, to increase uh, because of displacement of workers in the workforce, realization that additional skills are going to be necessary in order to deal with the economic realities that a, that a student or a household may face. So we see increase in employment. Somebody loses a job, they have time, they have the ability, if they have the ability, they have the time to go back to, to school. Uh, when the economy recovers, and historically this is a pattern that's more dramatic in some recessions or after some recessions than others, but it's not at all uncommon for our enrollments to drop. Uh, as people re-enter the workforce. Um, and again, it's pre more pronounced in community colleges than universities, but the trend is, is there in, in both cases. Uh, comparing this recession, and, and, and we're, we're out of the recession now, according to the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis, the people who call the timing on, on recessions and recoveries, um, we are now out of uh, the recession by, for uh, two years or so. Um, so it's not uncommon that we would see enrollment decline. In 1982, for example, the recession in 1982, we saw similar kinds of declines in enrollment. Um, the recession since then, between those two, between 1982 and the most recent recession in 2008 uh, that ended in June of 2009, um, uh, again, the trend was there, a little bit milder uh, adjustments than we've experienced uh, thus far in, in, in this recovery. So uh, the, the, the bad news is enrollment has gone down somewhat. Um, the, the good news is it's not uh, totally unexpected given the circumstances, uh, the economic circumstances of the, of the country and of the state. I do think it's worth noting that, and this may have been true in prior periods as well, we just hadn't had time to, to go back and look at it, and that's the kind of additional analysis that we'll be doing here over the next few months. Um, when you look at headcount enrollment and full-time equivalent enrollment uh, at most of our institutions, uh, full-time equivalent uh, enrollment dropped uh, at a, a faster pace than headcount, suggesting that students are still going to college, it's just they're more likely to not be able to uh, uh, have the wherewithal or have the, the, their circumstances to permit them to go full-time. Now, that's not true in every case. I think in four or five institutions, maybe the reverse is true. 
But that suggests, I think, that it's worth looking at at least and doing some analysis to the extent we can as to the effect not only of general economic conditions but also of tuition increases to see if that's influencing students' behaviors uh, in terms of uh, students still interested in going to school, they want to go, but they just they, they can't quite make an ends meet or they don't think they can afford it, so they register uh, for less hours and go part-time instead of full-time. Um, that's a very rational economic choice for a student to make. Um, it's not necessarily the best academic choice in terms of success. You know, the statistics uh, demonstrate fairly, uh, fairly well uh, over time that full-time students tend to do better. Uh, they're, they're, they, they tend to stick with it. They tend to complete uh, uh, more often in higher numbers, higher ratios than part-time students. So for us, I think it's certainly something that's worth looking at to, uh, uh, to uh, try to measure, if we can, uh, to some extent, the sensitivity of enrollment to uh, tuition increases. It might help us, inf might help inform our decision making uh, as we go forward. Uh, so that's something that we thought you would be interested in and, and just wanted to share with you, take this opportunity to share it with you. Um, I'd be happy to, to, to respond to any questions. Kay would be happy to, and we have several of our presidents in the room uh, that uh, might be in a position. I do want to make one particular uh, point of emphasis. You will see Austin Peay's enrollment uh, is uh, down to, uh, on an FTE basis 9%, slightly over 9%. When we present these numbers for Austin P, it's a little bit of a, not a little bit, it is an anomaly because they have two sessions uh, at Fort Campbell. Uh, so the, the current enrollment has the first session, but the second session uh, is not there. The number we're comparing it to, though, is the full year's enrollment uh, for last year. So, so we should see a swing at Austin P of somewhere around four to four and a quarter percent historically is the uh, uh, full-time equivalent enrollment of that second session at, at uh, Fort Campbell. So just to, to, uh, to note that so you, you understand that that number will change uh, in the second session uh, numbers are in. Thank you, Chancellor Morgan, for that report. Uh, are there any questions from the committee of the Chancellor or comments? If not, this was an informational item, requires no vote. And according to my agenda, uh, there is nothing else on our agenda unless some committee person has something else they'd like to uh, bring up or discuss. If not, we stand adjourned. Thank you, Thank you Regent Thomas. Uh, next committee is the Committee on Personnel, and I would ask the members of the Committee on Personnel to come forward, those members being Regent Paul Montgomery, who is chair of the committee. Regent John Ferris, Regent Kisper, Regent Markham, uh, Regent Roddy, and Regent Barlin, if you're still on the line.
detecting the presence of a quorum, I'm calling the Committee on Personnel and Compensation of the Tennessee Board of Regents to order. The first item on the agenda is recommendation for tenure upon appointment for 18 faculty members from Austin P. State University, Middle Tennessee State University, Mississippi State College, Community College, Tennessee Tech University, and the University of Memphis. At this time, we'll call on Interim Vice Chancellor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, as you may be aware, each at the September meeting each year, we bring forward to uh, this committee recommendations from the campuses to award tenure upon appointment to certain individuals who have been recruited uh, because of high-level qualifications and they're recruited into high-level positions. In most cases, they have held tenure at the previous uh, institution or affiliation uh, institution that they have, uh, where they have worked. And uh, it is a tool that the presidents have to have in, in order to sometimes attract the uh, most qualified individuals into their institutions. The uh, biographies of each of the individuals who is being recommended are contained in the uh, mail out or the materials that you have. And I would be happy to answer any questions about any aspect of these recommendations. Okay, you've heard the interim report, but the report from the interim Vice Chancellor Clark. Are there any questions? Is there a, is there a motion to approve? Okay, there's a motion to approve by, um, Chance, uh, excuse me, Regent Ferris. Ferris. Is there a second? Second. Second by Regent Markham. All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. The second item that we have Thank before you. us today is review and consider for approval the proposed system wide compensation increases. At this time, we'll call on Vice Chancellor Sims for comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, just as background real quickly on this, uh, you recall at your June meeting you adopted some compensation guidelines to uh, essentially guide the submissions by institutions as to individual adjustments, how they implemented their comp plans, uh, whether they offered an incentive payment, basically a non-recurring payment. Uh, the institutions were directed to supply those submissions to the central office. We've analyzed them, and this agenda item we're bringing to you with a recommendation for approval of the plans as submitted. This slide will uh, illustrate for you or show you uh, the, the plans that we did receive uh, by universities, community colleges, and then technology centers in the central office. Uh, you'll see that we have a variety, as we usually do. We have some institutions that or I should say five that offered no adjustments. We're not in a position to, to make a uh, request for any type of adjustment. We had uh, uh, three that were performance payments only. Uh, we had five that were uh, uh, further implementing their compensation plans, and we had um, six that were doing both a comp plan and a performance payment are proposed. Uh, the total amount, total value of these adjustments Senior material, but for your benefit, uh, the recurring amount is a little over $7 million. That represents about an eight-tenths of a percent of the system-wide payroll, so a very small uh, adjustment being proposed on a recurring basis. And the, uh, the incentive payments total about $4.9 million. The next several slides, Mr. Chair and members, uh, try to give you different uh, views uh, graphically of how this money is distributed. I call your attention on this slide to the yellow bars. Um, uh, the yellow bars by institution, this is for our university, show the, uh, the allocation of these funds for essentially the academic mission, uh, including instruction, research, public service, and academic support. On average at our university, 70% of this money was, uh, these compensation adjustments were allocated to that academic mission. Uh, next slide, we will show you uh, uh, division by type, basically, of employment, uh, faculty, administration, professional, and clerical support. Again, the yellow bar shows you the university average for faculty. A little over 45% of these funds are dedicated to faculty. A relatively small share on average to administration, larger shares for professional and clerical support staff. 
Mr. Chair, if there aren't any questions so far, the next, uh, the next two slides are similar slides uh, for our community colleges. Uh, again, the thing I'll highlight is uh, the far right-hand column, the community college average, the yellow bar, uh, over 84% of these funds were allocated to salary adjustments for uh, staff within that academic uh, area. Um, although the numbers, as, as you look through, do vary from institution to institution. And then the last slide that I have for you on this is, uh, is again, the breakdown at our community colleges uh, by type of employment. Faculty, again, lion's share of this uh, being allocated to faculty over 68% on average in the community colleges with, again, smaller shares to the other areas. Mr. Chair, that's a very brief description um, of what uh, we are recommending. Um, you had more material uh, in your board packages. I'll be glad to stand for questions, but we have reviewed this at, our, at uh, the board staff and recommend your approval. Okay, you've heard the report by Vice Chancellor Sims. Are there any questions? Okay, is there a motion to approve? System-wide compensation increases? So moved. Regent Kisper. First made motion, is there a second? Uh, I'll second, Mr. Chairman. Okay, second by Regent Ferris. Yes, okay. Regent Ferris. Why do we need to approve this? I mean, we, is this because it's outside of the 3% the or the whatever amount we gave to? Yeah, uh, Regent Ferris, uh, the, best, uh, the best answer I can give is you in one shape or fashion approve basically every salary action either through delegation to the chancellor or delegation to the presidents our practice has been during this cycle when there are uh, compensation plans to be implemented uh, that we bring these to the board for the board's consideration that is largely a matter of policy and guideline uh, that is before you today and so the the individuals you have listed here they would get these increases plus the whatever the increase they had earlier. That's that correct. The, the appropriation bill still require the boards to approve salaries? Chancellor, that's a great question. I don't think it goes into the level of depth that it did in the early 90s, okay. uh, but we still have a requirement that we okay. file a report with the Legislative Budget Office on these matters. Any other questions? This actually requires a roll call vote. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Regent Ferris? Yes. Regent Kisber? Aye. Regent Markham? Aye. Regent Montgomery? Aye. Regent Roddy? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Okay, the third and final item on the agenda today, the, key, the committee will now review and consider the performance evaluation of the Chancellor and uh, you've had before you the feedback uh, that we received, the Chancellor's self-assessment. They have the summary comments that were sent to you prior to today's meeting and it's available for this meeting as well. The feedback was solicited from a broad spectrum of folks. All the board members received, had opportunity to uh, respond. The University Community College Te Technology Center representatives, they also responded and we uh, also had feedback from the central office staff. As I mentioned before, this report has been provided in summary form. And as you can see in the report, the chancellor has done an outstanding job in his first two years. He is well regarded in the system, throughout the system and outside the system. The overwhelming positive comments, they uh, indicate a high degree of satisfaction in his abilities and support for his leadership. From a, board, from a very broad spectrum of constituencies. In summary, I find that Chancellor Morgan's overall performance for this period is deserving of very high marks. At this time, I will open it up for any other comments from the committee members. Anybody want to comment? I'll move approval of the report if that's what we need to do. Okay, I have a motion for approval of Regent Ferris, or second? Second. Is there a second by Regent Roddy? Uh, all opposed to the motion, say aye. Excuse me, all in favor of the motion, say aye. <laughs> <laughs> I, just want, I, just, I, just want, I just want to check to see if you're awake. I just want to check to see if you're awake. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed, motion like sign.
Okay, the motion carries. Thank you very much for thank your you. thank you very much for your comments. Thank you very much, Chancellor, for two great outstanding years. Yeah. You've set some high, very high marks for yourself, and the challenge is to continue on. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. I'll, I'll do my very best to do that. But uh, if I could, just I appreciate sure. very much the kind remarks from folks. Uh, but, but as I as I pointed out in the assessment, and and I would point out again today. Uh, you know, it's not me. It's it's a team of people at the board who do incredibly uh, powerful things. Uh, so, uh, it, it's our whole system, uh, and the system I think is working pretty well right now. But we are striving to work even better. So we'll we'll do our best to uh, to get even higher marks uh, at the next opportunity. I'm sure you will. This concludes our agenda for the personnel committee on compensation. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? second. The, the Committee on Personnel and Compensation for Tennessee Board of Regents is now adjourned. Thank you, Regent Montgomery. At this time, will the members of the Committee on Finance and Business come forward for the Committee on Finance and Business Operations Committee? Those members are Regent John Ferris, Chair of the Committee, Regent Griscom, Regent Reynolds, Regent Rhoda, Regent Roddy, and Regent Humphreys. This is the Finance and Business Operations Committee, and uh, the chair detects that we have a role. The first item on the agenda is a review of the consent agenda. The consent uh, items being presented for approval are as follows. New policy 1 colon 03 colon 02 colon 20 delegation of authority. Second item is uh, it's a new policy, 4 colon 01 colon 01 colon 20, dealing with debt management. Uh, you have all, I think, seen this before. You had it in your materials. Uh, does anyone want to move either of the items off of the consent agenda for a separate vote? If not, is there a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda? Move it. It's moved by Regent Griscom. Is there a second, please? Second. Second. Uh, are there any, is there any discussion about the consent agenda? It requires a voice vote if you call the roll, please. No. Uh, sorry, was there? A, I'm sorry. Call for the vote. 
Do, do we need to do a roll call? You can just do it by voice oh, vote. Oh, it not says roll requires call. voice vote, and I just said call the roll. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you can do. I can do it That's either why way. I should read these scripts, <laughs> <laughs> or try to read these scripts. Maybe I should read the script. All right. Well, we'll have a voice vote for the consent agenda. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed. All right. That's approved. Made it through the first one. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a report regarding the 2012-2013 Technology Access Spending Plans. At this time, I call Dale Sims, Sims for any remarks on this report. Dale? Apparently, no <laughs> Apparently he has no remarks. <laughs> <coughs> no, he said earlier to me, John, that he, do, he wasn't going to be speaking to us today. So let's see yeah. <laughs> He has no comments. <laughs> he had enough at the last committee meeting. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions of uh, Vice Chancellor Sims? All right, this is an information item. It doesn't require any action. The next item is review of the minutes from the September 5th meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on Capital Outlay and Capital Maintenance. This time I call on Vice Chancellor Gregory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to the uh, uh, members of the committee and to all the regents. Um, this is the uh, same rhythm that we typically follow relative to the approval of the capital budget. You have an ad hoc committee on capital outlay who has reviewed the capital budget presentation, have approved those and offer them to you in a set of minutes. Um, and the approval of, uh, of those minutes, after the approval of those minutes, then I will uh, make the present, full presentation of the capital budget to the full committee. All right. Uh, we've, the members of the committee have received copies of the minutes. Uh, does anyone have any changes to the minutes from the meeting? I have just one grammatical correction on the second line, top of page three. Okay. Last year's capital outlay list, we have a typo on those two words. All right. Uh, the uh, we've got the change noted. I'm sure, we'll make those in the final version of the minutes. Does anyone else have any uh, additions or corrections they'd like to make to the minutes? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting of the committee meeting? I'll move it. All right. Moved by uh, Regent Griscom. And uh, seconded by uh, Regent Reynolds. Is there any more comments or uh, notations to the minutes? This requires a roll call vote. Regent Ferris? Aye. Regent Griscom? Aye. Regent Humphrey? Aye. Regent Reynolds? Aye. Regent Roddy? Aye. Motion carries. All right, go ahead, Dave. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll now pre I will make presentation of the 2013 and 14 capital budget and uh, requires just a little bit of coordination here. You have a set of materials that are in front of you and I would also refer you to the screens that are in front of you and I'll try to toggle you between those two as I make the uh, presentation and I am pleased to be able to present to you today the 13-14 uh, capital budget um, and also the, the five-year request for capital funding and uh, if I could direct your attention to the screens uh, that are in front, in front of you. There are um, three classifications of projects that compose the capital budget, and they are the capital outlay projects, the capital maintenance projects, and then the project disclosures that utilize either school bonds or other funding sources. And these classifications are in accordance with the guidelines of the Higher Education Commission and the administration for the compilation of capital budgets. The capital outlay projects on the standardized list have been objectively analyzed for their priority according to the formula developed for the purpose. The three categories of evaluation in this formula are the type of space in the project, the composite shortage, and the functionality and quality. The formula also uh, includes a narrative on how this project supports the principles of the Complete College Tennessee Act. And in addition, the, the uh, print project principles for capital outlay includes a match component. 
And Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we are uh, recommending uh, completion funding of five of the 16 projects that are on the system capital outlay request for 1314. This is on page five of your booklet. And we are also recommending approval of all 16 projects, but are only requesting completion of the funding of these first five listed and then the six projects, projects number six through 11, for planning on the capital outlay list. In the left-hand column is the year in which the project was placed on the list. Mr. Chairman, I think it might be appropriate for me to talk just a few minutes to you about how the this is such an important outlay list, how this uh, list is both uh, formulated as well as how it is um, moving forward. I would like to remind the members uh, of the committee that last year the governor um, stated to us that he would really like to see capital outlay projects begin moving again in higher education. And in doing that, he wanted uh, each respective system to uh, evaluate their priorities in view of the Complete College Act, and then also to look at the need for outlay projects versus maintenance projects, and then also to see about leveraging state funds with uh, private matching funds. And so you see that incorporated into these uh, recommendations, and you, uh, I think we all celebrated last year when we were able to see the first year of that come uh, into being with the funding of the science building and also a very robust $40 million in capital maintenance uh, for, for our facilities. You see the evolution now of how that um, um, plan will evolve into subsequent years. Last year we were allowed to begin planning the next five projects on uh, the capital outlay list, the Nashville State Project, the Northeast, the University of Memphis project, the Vol State project, as well as the Columbia State project. I would mention to you that those projects have been, uh, the, the pre-planning has been funded by the institutions, and they do, are doing that as a portion of their match requirements. The match requirements you likely recall are 25% if it's a university project, 10% if it's a community college project, and 5% if it is a technology center project. So we're now in a position to be able to recommend to you uh, the completion of those projects and then the beginning planning for the next six projects down the uh, uh, Regents list, project number six through 11. I'd also like to point out uh, uh, to the members of the committee as well as um, to the full Regents that we have entertained and recommended, as well as your ad hoc committee, a project substitution on behalf of the University of Memphis. You see project number three, community health facility, and project number 13, biochemistry facility. Those projects are reversed in their order pursuant to a request from President Rain's evaluation by our staff and recommendation uh, to you. Um, a little, just a little bit of history about why we have this provision in our capital outlay um, uh, plan. We placed the ability for the board to be able to entertain substitutions at a period of time when our project list was extremely stagnant. And um, you've heard lots of talk about the MTSU Science Building being on our list since 1998. Because of the stagnation of the list, we entertain the idea that a, an institution's priorities might change before they actually got into the funding zone. This, in fact, has occurred. The uh, priorities for health and health-related programs at the University of Memphis now uh, supersede their uh, priorities for, um, for their science program, as well as uh, a large jump on private fundraising uh, for this project. I think. Um, when, when Dr. Rain submitted the request, she already had raised about $7.3 million towards their goal of trying to fully raise about $14 million in private funds uh, for their match portion. They're not quite there yet, uh, so the remaining portion of the match will be uh, institutional funds until they can do that. But I wanted to point out that's the movement in the list this year. MTSU Science comes off the top. The other projects rack up. 
and we're also able to add three projects to the bottom of the list, and I'd like to talk with you about those. The MTSU Academic Classroom Building, a statewide recommendation for community college additions and renovations, and a statewide um, project for technology centers additions and renovations. Next, Mr. Chairman, then that makes our recommendation for uh, capital outlay for 2013, 2014, $181,990,000 in capital outlay funding is very important for the quality of our facilities. And over the past five years, we've received an average of about $60 million each year, which includes the special capital appropriation that came in 2010. And we're very appreciative of that five-year funding. I'm going to move now to the presentation on capital maintenance. Again, this is one of those areas that can easily be overlooked in a budget, but is extremely important to each one of our institutions. Over the past five years, we've received an average funding for capital maintenance of approximately $23.5 million each year. And this equates to less than $1 per square foot per, for maintenance. And we're appreciative of this level of funding over the past five years, but we need to continue to make sufficient uh, funding for capital maintenance a priority. The, the formula presented for you on booklet page eight is the formula that we have used uh, to produce what I call an enterprise target for funding for capital maintenance. It produces a very large number, 97 point one million dollars slightly over four dollars per square foot and that reflects uh, the age of of our uh, facilities and the co constant need for capital maintenance um, mr. chairman part of what we ask ourselves last year in the governor's challenge was what can we reasonably get done in a year that would be improvements over the smaller amounts of maintenance that we uh, have been receiving in the past. That question was asked of our system as well as the University of Tennessee system. And the, reflect, the request to you comes today that we think that in a given year about $45 million is what we can reasonably get done in a, in a single year in terms of capital maintenance. And so that is the request that we're making to you today that uh, the first 43 projects that you will see uh, on your capital uh, maintenance list uh, are those projects for which we are, are asking funding. You will see that uh, listing on pages 9 and 10 of your uh, uh, booklets. We're asking for funding through project number 43 on the uh, maintenance list. You can see, as you go on through that, that uh, there are many other unmet capital needs, uh, maintenance needs that our institutions have submitted and are documented. Uh, $203 million worth of capital maintenance projects have been documented by uh, our system and are included in your booklet. Um, Again, it's, it, it's somewhat of a calculated guess, Mr. Chairman, as to what we think we can get done in a year. What we don't want to do is have projects laying over from year to year. And so um, we've been successful in meeting our target from last year and believe that's the appropriate amount to recommend for uh, maintenance going forward. Over the past 10 years, we've received um, funding has been about $426 million less than our target. And that just goes to show you what uh, uh, constant need for aging facilities uh, produces uh, in annual maintenance need and, again, renews the interest in why capital maintenance is such a major issue. Can I refer you to pages 14 and 15 in your book? And this is the third area of the capital budget presentation. It's called project disclosures. This is where we're not asking the state for additional dollars, but it has been a long practice, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for us to uh, disclose to the um, General Assembly those projects for which our institutions are considering funding through 
uh, some of their own reserve funds as well as bonded fund projects. It could be grant funded projects and it could be uh, gift funded projects. What you see are 39 project disclosures. These are not in any ranked order. Uh, they come from various uh, universities, community colleges, and one technology center. And it's basically a heads up that uh, these projects are being contemplated uh, by our campuses. I would tell you that some of these projects most certainly will be completed. Some of them may never be, but they um, are required to be disclosed so that uh, everyone has an understanding that uh, these projects are at least in the works. We get a second opportunity to do this, a second disclosure process somewhere around the time just previous to the state appropriations bill uh, being adopted. Now let me talk to you about my in summary about the five-year uh, estimates. Next slide and page 16 in your booklet shows a five-year estimate of how the listed ranked capital outlay projects might possibly be funded in the first three years of five-year estimate. And since actual appropriations will vary from our annual request from outlay, the totals for years two through five most certainly will change. An allocation for capital maintenance is shown along with yearly totals, which produces a five-year total of just under $1.3 billion for our capital budget estimates. Also, members of the committee, the next slide, booklet pages 17 and 18, will show you the unranked first and second priority at capital outlay for our institution. And these projects are, are pending a future ranking, but kind of give you an idea of what the institutions are thinking about, total over $500 million. And this is disclosed for information purposes only. The next slide, page 19 in your booklet, gives a recap of the staff recommendations for the 1314 uh, capital budget request for a total of $227.4 million. Your ad hoc committee on capital outlay and capital maintenance chaired by Regent Ferris has approved uh, this recommendation. Um, and I'd like to present the recommendation uh, for your consideration and, and approval. I'd also, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, discuss for just a moment um, the um, initiative that we have seen the legislature engage in for uh, the last year and even in, in years previously relative to equipment purchases for our technology centers as well as our uh, community colleges. The legislature has been gracious over a period of time. Some of you have been on the board long enough to remember uh, a fairly significant appropriation for technology centers to help them have uh, up-to-date uh, uh, equipment at their facilities. Um, it was contemplated again last year, although it wasn't funded, that a, a fairly significant appropriation be given both to our technology centers and a lesser appropriation to the community colleges to help with the uh, purchase of uh, equipment. I anticipate that that effort may um, arise itself again. I just wanted to make you aware of it. I'd like for you to be supportive as we have been of that, um, of that initiative in, into the future. So with that, Mr. Chairman, let me stop and, and ask for any questions that anyone may have about the uh, capital budget. And after the action on the capital budget, I just would have one other small item I'd like to speak to the board about. Any questions uh, about the, the budget that uh, Vice Chancellor Gregory has presented? If not, is there a motion to approve the uh, presentation of the capital budget for fiscal year 2013-2014? Move. Regent Reynolds <laughs> moves it. Regent Griscom seconds. All right. Any questions, comments, additions? If Still not, I'm sorry, Howard. Go ahead. Where will we go from here once this is approved to yes. THEC or? Yes. And your the, the, this this recommendation will go to the Higher Education Commission along with the University of Tennessee. Similar type recommendation mm -hmm. where the two recommendations are consolidated and ported onto the governor. Thank you. All right, if there are no more questions, uh, Chris, I'd ask you to call the roll, please. Regent Ferris? Aye. Regent Griscom? Aye. Regent Humphrey? Aye. Regent Reynolds? Aye. Regent Roddy? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. It, and one thing that I forgot to mention when we approved the minutes of the ad hoc committee is one of the items that we had just for everyone out in the audience was we had a presentation from Dyersburg State 
on uh, a possibility of, of housing uh, at the community college. And we have asked uh, Vice Chancellor Gregory and uh, Dick Tracy to take a look at that and see under what circumstances, if any, and how that would look uh, if, if we were to approve some form of housing at community colleges. And so yes. that, was, that was in the minutes that was approved, and I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Go ahead, David. May I, may I just take about five minutes of the committee's time and just, um, just, this is just a very small presentation about the magnitude of the size of the, of, the, of, of the enterprise for which you have responsibility for as it relates to facilities. I have just a few what I call sort of wow numbers here, but it, it helps kind of put in perspective the size uh, of, our, uh, of our institution. Uh, the first is that are the total number of buildings that are part of the Board of Regents system. 100, I mean, uh, 1,344 total buildings, 912 of which are our ed education in general buildings, which total about 25 million square feet of, of building space. 432 auxiliary buildings, which add an additional $7.8 million in um, square footage for a total of 32.7 million square foot of, of building space in the Board of Regents system, and you can see the $6.5 billion uh, re replacement cost. I spoke to you today about the need for capital maintenance. This next slide kind of helps to illustrate where we are in terms of the age of our facilities. The university system, this is the age of all of the buildings uh, in the university system. 45.7 years is the average age of university buildings community college system is a bit younger than that at about 30 uh, years and the technology center uh, building age average age is 34.3 years oldest building in our system just for your information is a pre uh, frequently asked question is the law school at the University of Memphis which was the old um, post office customs house and built in uh, 1885 and just as a point of trivia the oldest academic building on each one of the uh, university campuses are listed for you so you can see this sort of relative age. The next three slides are just really slides about coverage. And here's sort of the university uh, footprint for coverage. You have the university, oh, let me start from west to east, and you see the University of Memphis has two uh, off-site campuses in Shelby County, one in Collierville, one in Millington, and now the campus up in Madison County at, uh, at Lambeth. As you come across the state, Montgomery County, Austin P has its main campus, as well as a Fort Campbell facility. Coming into Nashville, Tennessee State University has its facility, as well as a downtown campus. MTSU also in Middle Tennessee. Cookville has its campus, as well as a craft center in DeKalb County. And then East, T East Tennessee has its facility, a location in Kingsport, as well as the Bristol Family Medical Center. You know these are regional in universities, so they have much broader reach than where, you, where they are, but there's kind of an idea of coverage from a university perspective. Here's how it looks from the, from the community college perspective on the next slide, and what I just ask you to pay attention to, I, I certainly won't go through this, but the dots. If you can kind of look at the counties and the dots, you see that we have a, either a permanent or semi-permanent location in all of these different spots uh, across uh, the state. The different colors are the service areas for the community colleges. The next side is the technology centers, and what I've done there is driven, uh, uh, drawn a 30-mile radius. I know that's rather busy, but it's a 30-mile radius around each one of our campuses, and uh, you will see the significant coverage that if you were to go any 30 miles from a technology center, um, how the state would be covered. So you can uh, also see the new, the new site we'll bring on and Clark will actually provide us additional coverage there. The next, um, the next uh, uh, slide I have for you is to look at the, the space that is coming online. We currently have either in planning or construction about 1.9 uh, million squ new square feet of space through, throughout the system. Um, the 2010 special capital outlay for community colleges is beginning to come into uh, uh, online now. 
the two new technology centers in, in um, Elizabeth and in Clarksville will be coming online. And uh, so you see significant new growth coming into the system. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just would, um, with, all the, with all the size and the facilities, part of what we always have to pay attention to are uh, making sure that we're doing what we can to save energy costs. It's a huge big spin for each one of our institutions. Um, the Board of Regents system about seven or eight years ago uh, was a leader in performance contracting. We've been across the state with uh, ESCOs. We have done performance contracting in most of our institutions where we have retrofitted lighting and other type facilities to save energy. We have a natural gas purchasing program. We, have, we are doing sustainable design on all of our new facilities coming online. We consider TVA as a very close partner in uh, things that they have funded through grant funding. Uh, through some of the demand reduction programs. And then we're also looking at, uh, in construction, energy saving equipment and materials, things like geothermal and other type things that might save energy. So we want to try to always consistently try to evaluate how we can do better in building sustainable facilities to conserve as much energy as possible. With that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the indulgence of the committee. It's just good to take a breath every once in a while and think about the size and magnitude of the sure. facilities. Yes. On your first chart with four year institutions, what I would like to see at some point is the extended outreach they have with all the online programs. While we look at physical, meaning we look at buildings and things like that, which are fine, but I think we also need to look at it in terms of because of the programs that the Board of Regents have, which are much more accelerated than those on the universe, in the University of Tennessee system, what is that extended outreach? And the reason I raise it, because that to me says that maintenance is very, very important going forward. Because you got to maintain what you have right now as you bring in more students who come in online. So I would be interested at some point that shows how much that outreach adds to the four-year schools so that you get a, a much larger picture of, of other areas of the state we touch. For example, I know there's a lot of touching in my home county of Hamilton because several of the Board of Regents schools do a lot you know, to attract students uh, through the online courses. Okay, sure, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Vice Chancellor Gregory? Thank if you. If not, that uh, that concludes our committee for today. Is there any further business before the committee? If not, the committee is adjourned. Thank you. Regent Farris, that concludes the committee meetings for today. I want to take this time to thank uh, Matthew Tolbert, as well as Alicia Durham, uh, Louis Turbin, and Dusty Sadler for sitting with us uh, today as part of the committee meetings. And I trust that you enjoyed uh, your participation uh, with us today. And if your schedules permit and you can uh, attend by, by sitting in the audience tomorrow. You are truly welcome to sit in on our uh, formal board meeting tomorrow morning, uh, uh, which will begin at 9 a.m. We'll have a presentation by uh, Dr. Height, uh, and as part of that presentation, there's a slight change for board members. Typically, we start by sitting in the audience doing the presentation, but we've been asked to sit uh, in our board seats uh, for the presentation uh, uh, tomorrow morning. It's going to be a presentation, uh, a board member, uh, excuse me, a demonstration from a faculty and a board member on how iPads are greatly used in the classroom. Uh, our board meeting itself will then start at 9.30. Uh, remember, uh, as part of our process, uh, all board members will receive uh, this afternoon or early evening at the hotel a packet of the minutes uh, from today's board me uh, committee meetings, excuse me. Uh, and I would encourage you to check at the front desk of the hotel uh, to receive uh, uh, your packet of uh, minutes uh, so that you can review them uh, tonight. Uh, and with that, I would yield to Chancellor Morgan to see if there are any 
comments that he would have before we turn the, uh, the mic over to President Height. Um, no, Mr. Chairman, that uh, was, I was going to make sure everybody knew about uh, the ribbon cutting to come up, but I think that's probably what President Height's going to share with us. So. Thank you. I've got a very long list here of announcements, so, so kind of bear with me. Uh, definitely the ribbon cutting. Uh, we've had an opportunity, and I'll explain a little bit more. The ribbon cutting is a technology building has been renovated with the addition of the space that you had lunch in today. And so we'd like to have a ribbon cutting acknowledging uh, that building and what it's going to allow for us to do as it relates to workforce development. So those of you that can attend at 5 o'clock, we'd appreciate it. We also know it's been a very long day. Some of you got up early this morning to drive, so I will not uh, get too upset if for some reason you decide you need to maybe get back to the hotel because uh, we do have a hospitality room at the hotel in the Viking room. Uh, also, too, but because we have such a, a gap between the time that the committee meeting is ending and, and 5 o'clock, uh, Rick Creasy, who's my new director of workforce development, is going to be doing a presentation, and I think you'll find this interesting. In light of the governor, having made a comment recently, uh, was very concerned talking to Volkswagen that 92 out of 100 applicants for positions at Volkswagen were unqualified. We think we have a possible solution to that. So Rick's going to do a PowerPoint presentation in room 113 following this meeting if you're interested so that you won't necessarily need to go back to the hotel. As I say, the ribbon cutting is at 5 o'clock. A reminder that uh, the dinner will be at 7 o'clock in that same location. Uh, there will be shuttle from the hotel if you need to shuttle or if you're driving. We're pretty close, so driving is a little bit easy in terms of the amount of time and, and the distance to get here. You've already mentioned the fact that uh, tomorrow, if you'll be on the stage for the presentation, in fact, I'm looking at one of the presenters tomorrow. Uh, I think we have something that you'll enjoy very much in terms of what the technology will do, uh, both for the faculty member and for the students. So uh, I hope you find it interesting. Also, too, please take the time to read the local newspaper that you will find in your room when you get back to the hotel. I, I think you'll find out that we've had a significant impact on this community, and the newspaper has taken the trouble to write and share that with you. So, uh, oh, one more. I don't know whether any of you took advantage of the massage this morning. Uh, the young lady and her assistant is part of our new incubator. If you came in on the north end of the campus, uh, we have a new incubator on that end of the campus that is uh, the Innovation Center, focusing on jobs that are green. And uh, she will be out here this afternoon beginning at 3.30, not with the massages, but she sells natural skin care products. For, so that for those of you that need to take a gift when you go home, this is your opportunity while you're here without having to leave campus. So uh, I, I think I've covered just about everything. And I do want to thank Stuart Smith and the Technology Center at Athens for the lunch. They, they picked up the tab. And I'm hoping you took the time to look at that small placard that was on the table. Uh, the TTC at Athens, and you've already heard about the TTCs, have also accomplished a lot. And so uh, again, I thank you, Stuart, uh, for that lunch. Are there any other questions I might be able to answer? Rick will be in room 113, which is just out here in the hallway, and we'll probably begin that session at 315. Again, the ribbon cutting is at 5 o'clock, and we hope that you'll be there. Thank you, Dr. Hyde. There being no further business to come before the TBR committees, uh, committee meetings are adjourned.